Right, okay, so let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to uh, give a talk here. I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm trying to get through this. Um, so I was asked to talk about, say something about higher quantization, which is what I'm going to do. Um, so here's a, a very sketchy outline of what I'm going to speak about. Now, uh, when I was preparing this talk, I was conscious of the fact that on the last talk, on the last day of the five-day conference, everybody's tired and probably wants to get home. And, um, so I tried to prepare something very simple. I'm going to talk about a very, very simple model that I'm going to use as a toy model to discuss um, some, some problems that have physical relevance. Um, and then I think I give a, give a good overview about um, what a good notion of higher geometric quantization might be. So this model is going to be very simple, work in a very simple setting, and that's also because I'm conscious of the fact that we're a mixed audience of physicists and mathematicians with varying backgrounds. So while not everybody maybe understands every bit of the talk, I hope there's something in this for everybody to kind of sink their uh, teeth into. Um, the experts will know what sort of obvious generalizations of what I'm presenting is anyway, and there is indeed a bigger context than what I'm speaking about um, should be applied. So I'm going to talk about these things called magnetic Poisson structures. I'll define what they are, tell you why I'm interested in them, and then we're going to head off and try to quantize these things. Again, the experts will tell me, maybe not here, but they have told me there's you know, lots of ways to think about the quantization of these things once you see what they are. Um, a lot of which has been done in the literature. Um, but the point I want to take here is I want to do things in a sort of, I want to extract physics from it. So you know, there's this kind of tension between developing higher or formal tools and trying to extract physics and being able to explain it to physicists. Okay, so I'm going to look at three perspectives on quantization of this. Um, each of the three perspectives are complementary to each other to some extent, and each of them has their own problems. Okay? So I'll start off by looking at deformation quantization, which we'll see is more or less the, somehow the most straightforward way to attack the problem. I'll look at a technique, I'll then look at two techniques which try to bring this closer to a kind of operator state formalism in quantum mechanics. So the first will be symplectic realization, which is um, a way to kind of hide away some, um, some features of non-associativity that come up in these models. And then finally, we'll come to the higher stuff. We'll end with the higher stuff um, and think about um, tackling the non-associativity dead on and looking at a very <coughs> higher geometric quantization. This is not going to be a general discussion of higher geometric quantization, because that's complicated. We don't know how to do that in generality. This is just a very simple example of what such a construction could be. OK. So what do I mean by magnetic Poisson structures? This is easy stuff. OK. Again, I'm going to look very simple. We take n to the rd, OK? And I think of this as a configuration space of some dynamical system. And then I look at the dual space of Rd as a vector space. I think of this as the momentum space okay, with the canonical dual pairing. And then I form, form the phase space, which is the cotangent bundle of M, but in this case it's a simple thing. And there's a canonical symplectic form on here. So the, I denote the dot here just the canonical pairing between the momentum space and the configuration space. Okay? Very, very simple. You, again, if you can do everything here globally in this setting, you might want to think that this is some local um, construction. Um, you might think of generalizations where, you, so T star M you can think of as a, as a Lie algebra, so you can think of replacing T star M with some other Lie algebra. So there are lots of generalizations. Let's stick to this. Now I put some more data in. I introduce a two form that I'm going to call a magnetic field, okay. for reasons that will be obvious. Um, and then I shift. I shift my canonical symplectic structure oops, by this two-point. Okay. 
So rho is in general. It's not in general closed. I don't demand that it's closed. If it's closed, this would be another symplectic structure. Okay, but it's not in general closed. So it's just an almost symplectic closed. So it's non-degenerate, but not necessarily closed. Um, and it's not degenerate, so I can look at its inverse, which is a bivector, and from that bivector, I can construct a set of brackets on the algebra of functions on phase space, and the brackets of coordinate functions look like this. It's just the canonical phase space relations, but then I deform the momentum commutators by this two far. So this is an example of a twisted Poisson structure. It's twisted exactly by the exterior derivative of this two-form. So it gives me a three-form here. I'm going to call this the magnetic charge. <coughs> it should maybe be magnetic charge density, but we'll call it this. And, uh, and this defines uh, these brackets now generally define a non-associative algebra structure. Okay. If you calculate the Shouten bracket of this bivector with itself, it's non-vanishing in general. It's controlled by the curvature of this almost symplectic structure here, and the Jacobiators are given by this, this formula. So this is a tri-vector here, and the Jacobiators look like this. And the only non-vanishing Jacobiators are among the momentum coordinates here, and they're given by the components of the curvature of this two-form. Okay. So this is a, a, a slight generalization of a model that was introduced in the mid-80s by Grenadian and Zanino. Okay, this is a simple model. Why are we interested in a simple thing? Um, well, first of all, this um, fits into um, the physics of magnetic molecules. So we specialize the three dimensions, and we choose the two-form in a special way. Essentially, take it to be the Hodge dual on R3 of a, of a vector, and that vector represents a magnetic field. On R3, so that algebra I wrote down before governs the motion of some electric charge in a magnetic field. Okay, now if this thing I call the magnetic field is a closed two-form, then this <coughs> these brackets just tell me the standard Maxwell theory, which says that there are no magnetic sources. Okay, so the closure condition is just the same as saying this two-form. It's closed. I'm working on R3, so we also know that we can introduce a globally defined uh, vector potential or one form into the game. Um, there's a somewhat more interesting story when we put magnetic charges in. So the simplest case is you put a point-like magnetic charge at the origin, the direct monopole, and then away from the origin, you can define uh, the magnetic field of the monopole. Um, it's again got a, a local vector potential associated, which is given by this formula, and then this vector n is some fixed unit vector that tells you the direction of the Dirac string singularity. So the vector potential has a bigger singularity than uh, this thing here. And so this is an example of magnetic charge. Um, Originally, um, you know, so the magnetic monopoles have been somewhat elusive to experimental verification, but actually there has been over the past 10 years or so um, a string of experiments preparing to actually measure magnetic monopoles in the lab. Um, so these, these experiments are they're condensed matter experiments. They look at special um, compounds, special <coughs> materials that have a very distinctive crystalline structure, so these things called spin ice pyrochlor lattices, where, where the atoms are arranged in these kind of tetrahedral <coughs> configurations, and so the tetrahedra have um, magnetic dipole moments pointing in and out of these tetrahedra. And if you apply a magnetic field to these compounds, you can create little dis, you know, disorders in the crystal that simulate the direction of kind of the string of Dirac monopoles. Okay. So you do that, and then the way they observe this is they put, so they apply the magnetic field, they fire some neutrons at this material, which the neutrons themselves have an electric dipole moment, and then they observe these things scattering off these Dirac strings in some kind of interferometry experiment. Okay, so there you go. Next time you're writing a graph, 
grant application about higher structures, keep this in mind. <laughs> higher structures in the lab. Okay. But anyway, so that's the Dirac monopole. But really what I'm interested in is, a, is an extension of the notion of Dirac monopole to where we don't have a point-like source of magnetic charge. We really have some smooth distribution. So that's really the example that I want to keep in mind. So why am I interested in that example? <coughs> Well, there's a somewhat more far-reaching um, hypothetical application of this to string theory, in, in particular flux compactifications of string theory. So I do a very simple thing with this algebra, this plus on structure I wrote down. I apply what I call a duality transformation. This is just um, a, this is a symplectomorphism of the canonical symplectic structure of order four. So people in quantum gravity uh, like to call this Born reciprocity, if you've ever heard those words. So it's just a way of saying that uh, the rules of position and momentum are somehow equivalent. So when I do that, I take my two-form on M, and I replace it now with a two-form on M star, the momentum space. So we go configuration space, momentum space. And now the twisted Poisson brackets look like this. So now I have a non-vanishing XX commutator. <coughs> so, the, so the curvature now of this two-form beta, something I call the R-flux. And this gives me now a non-associative configuration space. So before my momentum space was non-associative, here the configuration space is non-associative. And this model has been proposed um, as the, the algebra that governs the phase space of the zero modes of closed strings, which propagate in things called locally non-geometric backgrounds, locally geometric flux backgrounds. And from this perspective, the word non or locally non-geometric means that we have a non-associative algebra structure. We quantize that, we've got some non-associative quantization of space. Okay, so that's where this is of interest in string theory. So thinking about these two models themselves raises a couple of questions immediately. So first of all, if I'm thinking about, I want to understand string theory in these flux compactifications, how do I quantize them? So what's, what should substitute for canonical quantization of a closed string in a locally non-geometric background? How do we do that? <coughs> and more generally, going back to the example of the magnetic monopoles, is there some sensible notion of non-associative quantum mechanics? So not just quantum, not just quantization, but can we, you know, do we get a sensible physics? So this is what I want. This is what I want to talk about here. So let's let me just sort of very vaguely talk about the quantization of these uh, Poisson structures, and then we'll go and uh, make it precise. So I mean, what is quantization? It should take a phase space function and associate some sort of an operator to it. So I'm just call this some symbol that lives in an algebra, and when I calculate the commutator of these symbols, at first order in h bar, I should just reproduce the twisted Poisson structure, and then there should be correction. So this is, not, of course, not a, um, it's not a holomorphism of the brackets in general. There's corrections, but that's what I want. At the level of the coordinate functions, the bracket should map exactly, so I assume that the brackets map in this way, but if I look at more general functions, there is in general corrections to that. Okay, that's what I want. So what we're going to do in this talk is I'm going to give you some prospects for what these O's are. So here I'm not telling you what they are, but I'm going to give you some examples of what they are. So one of the crucial things that we'll see coming into constructing these, these quantization maps are things called magnetic translation operators. Because you have these canonical phase space operations here, um, you know, this is, this is the, the infinitesimal algebra of translations here. So you expect that your symmetry will have some kind of a deformed 
uh, translational symmetry. Okay, so this is well known for charged particles in a magnetic field. There is still, a, even though a magnetic field breaks translation symmetry, there is still a notion of a translation symmetry. Okay, so if you look at this algebra, these are the operators that formally do it, that, it, in, that implement the translations by a fixed vector <coughs> in RD. And then you ask, do these form a representation of the translation? And the standard physics calculation of this argues that, uh, well, they don't. They don't form a representation. They form something that looks like a projective representation, except in general. So this phase here is going to be the integral of this magnetic field over a triangle or a two simplex that's formed by these two translation vectors here. And it's based at this point x, x being where you operate here. But in general, it's not a projective representation because these operators turn out not to associate because we have these Jacobiators before. And the violation of, uh, of associativity is controlled by the curvature of this magnetic field, the integral of that curvature through a uh, three simplex that's formed by the translation vectors, or if you wish, the magnetic charge through this tetrahedron. So this is, an, and, and it turns out these things are three co-cycles, um, in this case of the translation group in a certain sense, which I'll discuss. And this is a very old paper by Jakeef, right? It's a really nice paper, but the problem is that the way the paper is argued, it's, these are, these objects that we call the P's here, these magnetic translation operators are assumed to operate on something. And it's, you know, it's just not clear in this context, what these things are operating on, right? because they, they don't associate, so we don't know, you know, we, we can't represent them on a Hilbert space. So one of the, the goals is to try to make some of these arguments more precise, um, and see to what extent we can do that. So let me just quickly go through the well-known case, so where d rho is zero. So we have a, an associative Poisson structure, so there's no twist, okay? So this is sort of, uh, you know, everybody, everybody knows. Okay. I'm going to do it in a way that looks like a bit of overkill, because I'm, after all, I'm working on RD, so I don't really need all this geometry. But I'm doing this for a reason that I'll come back to near the end of the talk when I look at a higher perspective on this. So I can think of this, mag this magnetic field is closed now, and we're on RD, so it's exact. And I can think of the one form A sitting there as the curvature one form of a connection on the line bundle over Rd, which is necessarily trivial. So think of that. And then, then this quantization map, I can represent on by operators acting on the Hilbert space of square integrable sections of the trivial line. <coughs> so I just represent them in the standard way using the connection associated to this one form. And then the uh, position coordinates just act as multiplication. Then these magnetic translations that I alluded to before are just given by parallel transport in this line bundle. So this is the formula for the parallel transport of a square integrable section in that bundle. So I integrate the connection one form over the line or the one simplex between x minus v and x. And then you go and you do the calculation, and you find that these things, of course, do not provide a representation of RD, but they provide a projective representation, and in fact, a weak projective representation in general. Okay? So there's a, a, a co-cycle sitting here, but in general, it depends on X. So that's what I mean by weak in this case. And you can make some of these definitions a bit more precise, but I'm not going to do that in this talk. So this is what I said before. You get the um, integral of the magnetic field over this two simplex. And in the special case where this um, two form is constant, then this just becomes um, sort of the, the phase you usually see in more elementary discussions of particles propagating in the magnetic field. OK, so this, um, as I said, it's a weak projective representation because it's not a u of 1 value 2 co-cycle, but it's a 2 co-cycle that's valued in u of one value functions. Okay? So the co-cycle relation 
This time it's got a little twist. Okay, now the significance of the magnetic translations <coughs> is they allow you to construct this quantization map. Okay, so you, first of all, you introduce a collection of operators that form something called the bile transform. Okay, so we're going to take a function on M and map it to an operator on this Hilbert space. Okay. I'm going to cheat here a bit. I'm going to sweep a lot of little functional analytic things under the rug. This is not really a map from C infinity of them. You should go from Schwartz functions or something, and then it's not going to become an operator on H. Again, you need to restrict it down to Schwartz things. But this is, these details are not important for what I'm saying here. You can make this all much more precise. So anyway, you introduce these things called magnetic model operators. So this is a family of operators on H, which is parametrized by phase space voids. It's defined by this formula here, and it uses these magnetic translations. And then the map up there that assigns an operator to a function is just given by first taking the function and calculating something that looks almost like a Fourier transform, except you're using the canonical symplectic form here, and then integrating against these um, parameterized operators. So that gives me an operator. Okay, so that's how you set up the quantization maps um, in this case. And then you can ask, um, if, I, if I multiply two of these operators together and then pull that back, what, is, what does that look like on functions? And of course, this is how you get a star product. In this case, I get something called the magnetic Moyaldale star product. That's defined by this formula. And you can work out what that is. And you get a closed expression for the star product. So without this omega factor here, which is what takes into account of the magnetic field, this would just be the standard Moyel star product on phase space. Uh, but in general, um, it looks like this. That's actually a nice formula if you're coming at this from deformation quantization, because it's not formal. Okay? It's, not an, it's not an asymptotic expansion in H bar. Okay, this makes sense as an oscillatory integral, so it's defined on a larger class of functions, for instance, Schwartz functions. Okay, and again, in the case where <coughs> the magnetic field is constant, then you can combine this Tuchel cycle factor into the canonical symplectic structure and write a more compact formula involving just this uh, shifted, uh, uh, this shifted symplectic structure here, okay, which is the formula you usually see. Okay, so the magnetic trans the messages, the magnetic translations give a bridge between two quantization approaches. They tell us how to go between geometric quantization, or if you're more physics inclined, you call this canonical quantization, and deformation quantization. And deformation quantization from a physics perspective is an alternative approach to quantum mechanics called phase-based quantum mechanics. And just to give you the list for those who are not familiar with this. In this formalism, observables and states become functions on phase space. Um, the operator product is just given by the star product here. Traces of operators are integrals of functions. Um, states are defined by a state function, which you should think of as a density matrix, so it's something that's non-negative, and we, which integrates or traces to one. And then expectation values are calculated using these state functions by uh, integrating star products of the corresponding functions together, and so on. There's a long di a kind of dictionary between canonical uh, quantization and, and the phase space approach here. Phase space quantum mechanics has its own <coughs> difficulties from the physical point of view. Okay, there's a, you know, the, the meaning of the wave functions in this approach is not always so clear. Um, the inverse of these, uh, these vial transforms up here are things called Wigner distribution functions, which should really be probability distribution functions in the quantum theory, but the problem is in general they're not uh, probability distributions. They're only quasi-probability distributions. So this has its own problems, but anyway, here's the bridge. Okay, so that's the standard story. Now, how do we deal with the case when 
There's a twist in the Poisson structure. Okay. Well, this approach I just mentioned cannot handle non-associative magnetic Poisson. <coughs> simply because I can't have non-associativity when I'm acting on a, a, with operators on a Hilbert space. Okay. Well, what about the Dirac monocle? So this is the simplest example. And, of course, we never hear about any problems with quantizing the Dirac monocle using standard methods, but that's just because you look at a different configuration space. You say that your particle's never going to meet the monocle, so you just excise the location of the monocle from the configuration space. So then, then your algebra is associated on this punctured space, okay? And we know that rho is exact locally. And then we can take the quantum Hilbert space to be the space of sections of a line bundle over this <coughs> space now. And it's going to be, it's a non-trivial line bundle in general. And that thing exists if and only if the Dirac charge quantization condition is satisfied. Okay, so this is a topological way of understanding the Dirac charge quantization that goes back many years, over 40 years ago. And, the, and then you can carry out this story of the kind of operator state correspondence. Again, you can uh, compute the magnetic Baal transform on here. Look at the corresponding associative phase space star product. And the, the same story goes through more or less. It's just things are a bit more complicated. So no problem with the Dirac monopoles. But if we want to look at generic smooth distributions of, uh, of, of magnetic charge, say in the magnetic monopole example, uh, these standard techniques just simply break down. So what do we do? The easiest thing to do is deformation quantization. So just go look, say let's try to do phase space quantum mechanics with this and go try to just quantize that using standard techniques. You can do that. Okay. You can use the standard for any three form. You can use the standard Kontsevich formality construction to construct a star product, a non-associative star product, which thematically looks like this. So it's, um, again, that medium order it gives us a quantization of these twisted Poisson structure. Um, and then it's given by an infinite series in terms of some bidifferential operators, which can be computed combinatorially. Okay. You can compute these as certain operators. So you think of these operators as being constructed using the legs of the bivector, theta, acting on functions. So that's what these uh, insertions in here. So these UNs are the Kamsevich formality maps. And we're here we're just, which are maps from multivectors to different <coughs> operators. And here we're just filling in all the slots of that with this bivector. So there's a prescription to do this. And likewise, at the same time, we get a, a quantization of the Jacobian. So here we get an infinite series and some tri-differential operators, um, which are obtained by again taking the formality maps <coughs> and putting the first slot in with this tri-vector that's given by the Shelton bracket here. Okay. So there's a way to do that. Okay. It's complicated in general. It's a complicated procedure. The constant which formalism isn't easy. But for H constant and for this choice of the magnetic field, you get a very simple formula, like this. <coughs> this formula is the same formula I wrote down on the last slide when I had the case where rho was constant, okay? The same formula holds now when h is constant, except, of course, this is not associated with anymore. And this is a nice formula, again, because the Kontsevich series, again, is formally uh, an asymptotic expansion in h bar, but this is not a formula makes sense as an oscillatory So now these magnetic translations can be written down explicitly. They're just given by functions. These functions here, as you would expect in this example, because we're just representing things with functions. And now you can make sense of this um, algebra, what, the, what this deformation of the representation is and the failure of associativity up here is. You just do the calculation, and you find that these things pi here are again given by the curvature of the magnetic field value in x. 
So then you get these three code cycles. So these are now u of one value three code cycles of the translation. You get that very precisely. And then you can go through the dictionary with the phase space quantum mechanics. And you find remark I mean, what was remarkable to us years ago is you get a sensible theory out of this. Sensible from a physics point of view. And every, every sort of test we try to see that, you know, do you get sensible observables? Is there a sensible notion of positivity, reality, and so on? You get a sensible theory out of it. And moreover, you get a quantitative theory. You can do calculations in this version of non associative quantum mechanics. <laughs> So just a, as a snapshot of something you can calculate, It'll go to the R-flex model, where you've swapped the interpretation of X's and P's, you can define an operator which measures volumes, okay, measures uncertainty volumes, okay? So you look at uncertainties in coordinates, calculate their, their star Jacobiator, and then calculate the expectation value. And what you can compute is that in that theory, there's actually a quantum, a minimal volume in the theory. So for instance, you're in three dimensions. This means you can't probe this, you can't probe this geometry with point particles. Okay, because there's a minimal volume in the theory. And this is something you can compare to expectation values, uh, expectations from non-geometric string theory. And they, 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 there are independent arguments that in three, if you're on a three-dimensional torus and you turn on one of these non-geometric fluxes, you're not allowed to put D0 rates into that background. And there's an easy way to understand that because those backgrounds are dual, T-dual, to a three torus with H flux, and then the D0 brain goes to a D3 brain. And you, you're not allowed to wrap a D3 brain on a three torus with H flux because of the free Whitney anomaly. So this nicely reproduces that. The problems with this, are, well, for constant h, we're okay because we have a nice explicit formula. Uh, but for, if you want to go beyond that case, look at more general, um, more general uh, curvatures of the magnetic field, uh, the quantization formula is only formal in h bar. Right? It's a quantization over the ring of formal power series, function value of formal power series. Okay, so that's not, that's from a physics perspective, that's not so nice. And then I said before there are issues with phase-based quantum mechanics in the standard case, and those issues certainly don't disappear here. There's still the usual issues. So deformation quantization does it very cleanly, in a sense. But still, what we, what we want is something closer to an operator state correspondence. Okay? We want some kind of a Hilbert space picture. How do we do that? So here's one way. So there's a technique from Poisson geometry called symplectic realization. And what is a symplectic realization of a Poisson structure? Well, it's a symplectic manifold together with a surjective submersion of that manifold over the original one, which is a Poisson map. So it preserves the Poisson <coughs> structures. OK, so the think of this, you could take your Poisson manifold, then you can embed it into a bigger uh, symplectic manifold. Then on the symplectic manifold, you can do geometric quantization. So this is the idea. So this has a, has a long history going back to the 80s. So it's a, the original construction, as far as I understand, is due to Weinstein. Uh, we did it locally, and then there were global versions done using symplectic throughpoints later. Um, and then it, the, this global extension was um, done in the case of uh, twisted Poisson structures by Titanio and Zhu, uh, but they did that um, by taking an almost symplectic realization, and not a genuine symplectic realization. <coughs> but what you can do, actually, is you can work out a local symplectic realization. I mean, we're working locally anyway, but the local, our magnetic Poisson brackets can be given a local symplectic realization. So this is something I worked out recently, um, just earlier this year with, uh, with Vladislav Kuprianov. And in fact, this can be done for any quasi-Poisson structure at a local level. 
So what it does in practice is it takes the face space and it extends it, it doubles it in a sense with some extra coordinates, x tilde p tilde. Um, using some uh, lo local pairs of Darboux coordinates and then defining <coughs> some generalized bop shifts in this one. Okay, so there's a systematic way to do it. And the result looks like this. The brackets look like this. So that's the answer. This, this I claim, is a symplectic realization of the magnetic Poisson structure. It's associative. Okay, and it satisfies this property that there's a together. And one way to understand this, this is actually intimately connected to the approach based on phase space quantum mechanics or deformation quantization. Because if I imagine quantizing this algebra here, okay, then I can represent that on the algebra of functions of the original phase space by choosing the tilde operators to be these differential operators. And then this algebra becomes an algebra that's that is exactly an algebra associated to this non-associative star product algebra. So it's called the associative composition algebra. It's an algebra of differential operators, so it's associative. And the product is defined by this formula here. So if you take three functions and you try to compute the star product. And so if you want to move this bracket over here, you define this composition product by this. So you can write out what this is explicitly. It's in general just a differential operator. Yes? So I don't understand. So this realization that's true, truly symplectic. Yes. Yes. And so in what sense now is, is there a map from the symplectic to this non Poisson thing? That's right. You can, so if you write down. If you the way the way to see it is you write down the corresponding symplectic forms, okay, the symplectic form corresponding to this, and then the almost symplectic form, the twisted, and then this pulls back to the uh, sorry the, the one up here pulls back to the symplectic the twisted one. But it's not non symplectic means on M, right? So it means it means over here, yeah, on this. Then I extend that. Yeah, you have some map from S to M. Yeah. And then uh, so you pull back this thing from M to S. Yeah. And then uh, and then what? And then it becomes this. Then it's uh, this. But it, it, it cannot be symplectic if we non close them and, and degenerate, right? I might lost some work in such a no the dimension of M. I mean they're well they're both non degenerate, right? Yeah, but the dimension of M is twice as smaller than, than that of, of, of S. So yes. if you pull back something, it's going to be very, very degenerate. And it's also not going to be closed, necessarily. Uh, so uh, but maybe, maybe I just missed something. So. <coughs> no, OK. I, I, maybe we should discuss that. Okay. OK, anyway, so but this, is, this is related to, um, to this construction I did. So this looks like a candidate to work with. What can we do with it? Well, you can define a Hamiltonian here. This is just a particular case of a more general class of Hamiltonians we can introduce. In general, these Hamiltonians have this uh, the sort of split signature symmetry group, like we heard in discussions of double field theory. Okay. Um, and like I heard that we heard in discussions of double field theory yesterday. And the significance of this is that with the brackets I wrote down previously, in three dimensions, this Hamilton, the Hamilton equations associated with that bracket in this Hamiltonian reproduce the correct Lorentz force law for the, uh, for the charge. Okay. So I don't have much time left, so let me try to get through this. I really want to get to the last part. Um, now, the problem with the approach is that, of course, you've got these extra variables in there. The extra variables were introduced to kind of hide away all this non-associativity. So you'd like to try to get rid of them at some point. You can't do that. You can't do that in any consistent way. There's no way to do a consistent Hamiltonian reduction that eliminates these extra coordinates. Okay? By consistent, I mean there's no way to do that that's consistent with the equations of motion you want and which preserves this non-associative magnetic plus algebra. So you're forced to live with the 
extra variables in this formalism, and you can ask what they mean. Well, if H is constant, you can argue that the Lorentz force equation it can be written in a way which makes it look like uh, the equation of motion of a particle in the Dirac monopole field, but with some additional frictional forces that come from the magnetic charge density. So this, you can think of this as a dissipative system, and in the a Hamiltonian description of dissipative systems, it's known you have to introduce extra coordinates because you, if you want to conserve the energy, you need to couple the system to a reservoir, and the extra coordinates will represent coordinates of the rest. So that's one way to think about it, but the problem here is that we, you know, in the initial formulation, energy is conserved. So, we, you know, this, these don't really look like they're um, reservoir. So the problem with this formulation is we don't know how to interpret the extra degrees of freedom. And again, we have these kind of interesting three code cycles in the game, and those have kind of been buried away now, right? Because everything's associative. Um, so we don't, we don't see this kind of interesting effect. They're there sort of implicitly, but they're there. So how do we get around this? Well, we say, OK, well, we need to tackle this non-associativity head on. And that's where we bring in the theme of this conference. So we look at higher structures. We we'll try to introduce a Hilbert space framework. We have to go up a notch. And going up a notch is, of course, the right thing to do. Because non-associativity just means we should work in a different category. So we replace Hilbert spaces with two Hilbert spaces of sections of a suitable geometric object, which encodes this three. <laughs> so, uh, so the experts know what this is. This is a gerb. So these are the <coughs> description I'm going to give is different from what Eric gave um, this morning. Um, so let me, I'm going to have to go quickly through this, I'm afraid. Uh, so uh, by the way, if we start with a subjective subversion over Manifold. We can form these fiber products here, which form a simplicial space. And in particular, the second fiber product forms the groupoid, called the pair groupoid. And then uh, a bundle jerk you could think of as a groupoid central extension of the pair groupoid. So here's the submersion, here's the groupoid, and there's the central extension. I'm always going to look at a line bundle jerks. And then because this is a groupoid, um, there's a groupoid multiplication. And so the bundle gerb also comes with uh, something called the bundle gerb multiplication over the third unrated products. And then there's an associativity condition under the fourth unrated products and so on. Okay, so this is the higher notion of the line bundle that we want here. Uh, then we need a connection. And so a connection, we put a connection on the line bundle and then a two form on Y, which satisfies this condition. And I realize now I just wrote this incorrectly. So this equation should read pi star H is the row, where H is a three form on M. So what's a section of a bundle gerb? Well, we just compare bundle gerbs now to bundles, to ordinary bundles. We know that uh, vector bundles sit in a, are objects in a category. And likewise, bundle gerbs are objects in a two category. In fact, it's a monoidal category enriched in monoidal categories. So this was worked out originally by Conrad Waldorf, and then a couple of years ago by Christian uh, Severin Bunk, who was my student at the time of this. Then, you know, so one way to think of sections of a vector bundle is that it's morphisms from the trivial vector bundle to the vector bundle when you're in this category. And that's how we define the sections of this bundle chart. Okay, so it's the category, the Hilt module category, where Hill is the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces of morphisms from the trivial bundle chart. Okay? I'm wrapping up, yeah. So this has sort of higher properties of, of the uh, of the, the space of sections of a vector bundle. So it's a rig module category over the category of permission vector bundles on M. And then there's an inner product bifunctor on it. Okay, so it's in this sense that it's a huge um, Hilbert space. In our case, the category has a very simple description because I just want to look at M equals RD. And I'll just think about trivial bundle jerk. So the bundle jerk itself looks like <coughs> this. But with a two form, that the objects are just 
permission vector bundles, which are trivial, and they have connections, so it's just equivalently just a U of n value. One form, and then a morphism is a parallel morphism of vector bundles, so it's just a function, matrix value function satisfying some parallel condition, which looks like a gauge transformation. So I'm just about done. So now, I'm really out of time, and I don't want to keep everybody here. Now you go through and just, you instead of parallel um, transport operators, you define a functor on this category, on this two building space. Okay? So there's a natural notion of, uh, of parallel transport, in this case, you can write down. And the higher stuff comes in now that when you compare, um, compare the composition of these two functors with the sum here, of course, these are functors, so the way to compare them is using coherence or nat natural isomorphisms. So we get these coherence morphisms, which are generalizations of these things I call pi in deformation quantization. And now the non-associativity of this co composition just follows from this condition here. And now you can see these three co-cycles coming up. And let me just go and <coughs> write the main theorem here. Um, and the main theorem now is that if you put this data together, you can give a general definition of what you mean by a higher weak two co-cycle. We did that in the paper. And also what you mean by a weak projective two representation. So this pair now defines a weak projective two representation of the translation group on the two Hilbert space of sections of this bundle. That's sort of the main. And there are various obvious is open issues to this. How do we make sense of this two Hilbert space physically? What, this, what does this all mean? And then also, there, you know, how do we bridge now with deformation quantization? So there's this sort of higher, higher quantization, geometric quantization. Independently, there was deformation quantization. How do they bridge together? Okay, and I'll, I'll stop here. One more thing. Yeah. As the last speaker, it is my duty, it's my honor to be able to say the final few words of the conference. And the main thing to say is many thanks to our organizers for having organized a brilliant week. So let's thank. Them. thank you. Do you have time for questions? Yeah, quick questions. Yes. Uh, can you, um, you, if you think of particles like living on this space, can you relate this non-associativity uh, to the fact that you can't write uh, actually the right equation of motion? So it's like non-Lagrangian system. And sometimes it, I think it is known that it may lead to non-associative quantization. Well, that was sort of the perspective of this uh, symplectic realization, right? Because you get, you know, it's the same with the dissipative systems that on their own you can't write a a conservative Lagrangian for them, but if you, if you introduce the extra degrees of freedom, then you can. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not sure if it relates directly to that, so. I'm not sure what your question is, actually. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not sure we, there, no, there's certainly no Lagrangian for, I mean, there, there is a Hamiltonian, right? I wrote down the Hamiltonian in the extended space, but. Uh, but, but I agree, I think these things are, are related. Because when you don't you know you don't have the vector potential, so it's, you can't really write down a, a Lagrangian for the system. Uh, when you introduce this um, uh, twist, so you have partial derivatives in the very beginning, you have partial derivatives will start to uh, well the partial bracket mm -hmm. will start to be uh, non non zero which roughly corresponds to some curvature, can be a relation to some curvature. And there are some, uh, well, in your case, it was a curvature in some <coughs> uh, But uh, there are some um, investigations in differential geometry, uh, well, I guess in 1960s, maybe 1970s, which are related uh, differential geometric structures like curvature and torsion, non associative algebra, and in general, non associative uh, algebraic structures. Mm -hmm. So you may want to have a look at that. Okay, 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 thanks for that. Okay, any other questions? Just thank uh